Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the 2017 Spring Term Honors Symposium From Public Toilets to Public Shame Medical Perspective of the 20th Century United States History. These past few months, my fellow students and I have been studying American history through the lens of medicine. Something that was very interesting, but might not be what many would think to look at first. Our primary focus was actually this book here, Howard Markell's When Germs Travel. It examined the easily and quickly spread diseases, tuberculosis, bubonic plague, trachoma, typhus fever, AIDS, and cholera, as well as how they shaped public policy and public opinion. Markell emphasized that epidemics have altered the lives of people that may have never even heard of a disease, much less met an infected individual. Prejudices were formed, and legislation was passed. Chinatown, for example, was quarantined for merely a handful of cases of bubonic plague in 1900, discriminating against the people instead of against the disease. And to this day, the United States closes its borders to countries with high rates of infection, like Haiti, only 20 years ago with AIDS, and West Africa with Ebola, only this past decade. Mexican immigration is something that remains a hot-button issue, but would you believe me if I told you that 100 years ago it was practically encouraged that in the late 19th century, and even today, Mexican workers were willing to do the back-breaking labor that Americans thought themselves too good for, such as laying railroads, and Mexican women did all the housework and child-rearing for wealthy American families. An outbreak of typhus fever, however, changed all of that. Mark Hill noticed that the disease was often associated with filth, starvation, and physical hardship. But these associations quickly shifted from the sickness to the people afflicted with it instead. Within seven years, the Mexican stereotype went from diligent and physically strong to filthy and sickly. Thankfully, America's answers to outbreaks were not always negative. The foundation of the American Lung Association was a direct response to the tuberculosis epidemic of the late 1800s. And the wave of trachoma under President Woodrow Wilson laid the groundwork for modern sanitization methods. Viruses, bacteria, and diseases have changed our past, present, and future in ways that we can't even imagine. And now, our four speakers will tell you all about how, beginning with a wonderful young woman from Mexico that is exceptionally passionate about the environment but is still looking for her academic passion. Katia de la Fuente will be presenting John's Crappers and Porcelain Gods, The Reasons Why You're Not Dead Yet. Let's talk about a crappy invention. A crappy invention that has improved health and quality of life more than any other in human history. Voted as the best medical advance of the last 200 years by the British Medical Journal, the Flush Toilet. And consider they were choosing it over the birth control pill, anesthesia, and surgery. But let's see a little bit of history before continuing. Romans used to be pretty comfortable with feces. At one point, Rome had 144 public toilets, long open benches that emptied into the Cloaca Maxima, a sewer system that carried waste to the Tiber River. But the vast majority of Romans simply poop in a pot and threw it into the street. As waste and disease piled up, Romans wanted to stink as a cause of sickness. After the Roman Empire faded away, this connection between bad air and bad health persisted, clogging up toilet innovation for more than a thousand years. We now know that avoiding dirt has deep evolutionary roots. Rotten smells can be signs of danger or disease that trigger our innate sense of disgust. During medieval outbreaks like the plague, doctors wore pointed masks filled with strong herbs or perfumes to cleanse that bad herb, which they believed to be the cause of the disease. And they were wrong. But this obsession with a stink would change your world in ways no one saw coming. 
The industrial revolution, most people business still end up in the streets and cesspools. And the growing population was a lot too big for long consumers. By the mid 1800s, the city was literally overflowing with crap. And the problem with all that poop lying around is and was that poop carries passengers. 50 communicable diseases led to trouble in human shed. All those things, the eggs, the cysts, the bacteria, all those can travel in only one gram of human feces. And I would like to tell you that we have left those practices on the past. But the reality is different. It's 2017, still 2.4 billion people, that's 40% of Earth population, don't have access to adequate toilets, not even the truth. Today, nearly a billion people still defecate out in the open, in the street gutters, in the woods, or in open water. But we know how to fix this, right? We know because in the mid-19th century, wonderful Victorian engineers installed systems of sewers, wastewater treatment, and the flush toilet. And the disease dropped dramatically. Child mortality dropped by the most it had ever dropped in history. And we have come a long way. Most of us in this room are lucky to live in a flush, privileged world. A world that make us forget about those 2.4 billion people out there who still don't have toilets. And consider some other numbers. 4,000 children die every day from diarrhea, a common symptom from exposure to many of those fecal microbes. That's more deaths from HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and measles combined. Countries look at it as water-related illnesses or as people need water. And they do. But what is the dirtiness in the water? It is usually crap. Clean water is no help when poor sanitation continuously contaminates it. Despite this, on the already small budget for public health, just 10 to 25% of related budgets focus on sanitation compared to 75 to 90% for clean water. Each year, $260 billion are lost because of the lack of sanitation. And when looking at the budgets of countries, you will see Pakistan spending 47 times more on its military than it does on water and sanitation. Even though 150,000 children die every year from the high aggression, in Pakistan, because of the area in Pakistan every year. But the humble latrine or flush toilet reduces disease by twice as much as just putting in clean water. Think about it. That little boy who is running back into his house, he may have, not, he may have a nice, clean, fresh water supply. But he has dirty hands that he is going to contaminate his water supply with. The flush toilet is a wonderful waste disposal device. So good that it doesn't smell. We even put it in our houses. We lock it behind a door. Magical chairs make nasty things disappear. Out of sight, out of smell, and out of mind. But the problem is we have locked it out of our conversation too. In TV shows, we never see toilets. Pooping is so taboo, it is literally invisible. And we don't have a neutral word for our waste. Poop is not particularly adequate. Shit offends people. And feces is too medical. It is not coincidence that many of our words swear the words in bulk defecation. And when thinking about the history of sanitation, Japan, 70 years ago, was a nation of people who use peat latrines and wipe with sticks. And now, it's a nation of what are called washuretos or washlight toilets. 
They have built the then nozzles for a lovely hands-free cleaning experience. And they have other features like heated seat or an automatic lead racing device known as a marriage saver. What they have done in Japan is that they have brought the toilet out from behind the locked door. They have made it conversational. People go out and upgrade their toilet. They talk about it. I don't want you to think that it is just in the poor world that things are wrong. Our sewers are crumbling. Things are going wrong here too. I hope today, the next time you find yourself seated on your porcelain throne, Think about it as one of the reasons you are alive today. I hope that you can get inspired about going out to speak about the unspeakable to others. To go out and talk about real shit. Thank you, Katia, for that wonderful speech. Wow. I never realized how grateful I should be for my toilet. <laughs> Up next is a mom, grandma, and slight overachiever. Michelle, who is currently in Phi Theta Kappa and the National Honor Society, is a compassionate woman who feels as though she must save the whole world. Michelle is currently completing her AA degree and graduating Broward Honors College next semester. After completing her AA, she will go to a university of choice to receive her BSN and then work towards a master's in nursing. Michelle is here to present her speech, Blame Game, the desires to demonize others throughout the history of diseases. Please help me welcome Michelle. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out today. Why do we humans have the desire to blame others for diseases? This practice is called scapegoating and has been going on for hundreds of years. The most targeted groups have been the Jews, minorities, other countries, homosexuals, and of course the poor. In the next few minutes I'm going to speak to you about a few diseases that have devastated our world and persecuted millions erroneously. First was the Black Death where over 50 million people died, annihilating nearly half the population of medieval Europe. Jews were blamed so often and so viciously, it's surprising it wasn't called the Jewish death. Europe's most deadly and devastating disease unleashed mass violence with organized massacres with over a thousand Jewish communities. Jews were scapegoats most likely because the infection rate was lower in their commun communities. The Middle Ages was wrapped with religious fanaticism, ignorance, superstition, and the apocalyptic nature of the plague catapulted the Christian's belief that Jews were destined to play a role in the end of days. On top of the fact that biblically, plagues have always been seen as a divine punishment from God. Ironically, the reason for the lower transmission rate was due to Jewish laws on cleanliness on bodies and around the homes. Simply by washing their hands before eating bread, after going to the bathroom and bathing once a week for Sabbath, reduced the transmission rates greatly in their communities. The Black Death came from a bacteria called Yersinia pestis, probably originating in Central Asia, going over to Europe on the boats, filled with rats, covered with fleas, who had the bacteria. This is what killed millions, not the Jews. Syphilis, the next disease I will delve into, devastated Europe, and then on to America, where Columbus expeditions introduced it to the New World. But this disease embodies the name Blame Game. It was quickly determined that it was a sexually transmitted disease and every country it touched wanted to blame the country it disliked the most. Case in point, British blamed French, it was a French disease. France blamed the Italians, it was a Neapolitan disease. Germans blamed the Dutch, Dutch disease. Then, Dutch blamed Spanish, Russians blamed Pole, Japan blamed Portuguese, Turks blamed Christians, 
And then when Columbus brought it here to America, it was known as the English disease. And after all the, those accusations, it was said to be contracted by the Native Americans. Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I first proclaimed, nothing like this disease has ever been seen before and that it was punishment from God for blasphemy. In the early 1900s, stereotyping caused real harm in the black communities here in the US. For example, the incidence of syphilis in the United States was relatively high in poor black communities. Some Americans researchers perceived this as an innate racial weakness, or now this black disease, cre that, that created the misguided prejudice that inspired the famous Tuskegee study, a racial and unethical project in where over 400 black men carrying the disease were observed but never treated for decades. The cost of agent was polydium tre po treponema polydium, possibly came from cattle or sheep, but no one knows for sure. But we, what we do know is it did not come from a specific country, religion, or race. The final disease I must talk about is the human immunodeficiency virus, or more commonly known as HIV. And to talk about HIV, we have to talk about the 4-H club. This group of people was targeted as the ones who contracted and transmitted the virus onto others. Homosexuals, Haitians, heroin addicts, and hemophiliacs, which is a genetic disorder with their clotting protein that requires frequent blood transfusions. It was commonly thought that the, targets, the virus targeted primarily the 4-H group. Thus, an exclusion against the group started to happen. Priests who were standing on their pulpits were teaching their congregation that HIV was a divine punishment for sinful conduct. Folks, this was 1980, not 1800s. Haitians seem to be the first group blamed for HIV. In December 1982, a physician from the National Cancer Institute came out wildly quoting saying, we suspect that this may be an epidemic Haitian virus that was brought back to the homosexual population in the United States. This is what we were told. This is what we believed. During this time, President Bush Sr. signed into office the policy on the exclusion of HIV-positive non-citizens into the US. America was one of only a handful of countries that had a total and complete ban on HIV-positive non-citizens. In September 1991, Haiti had a bloody coup d'etat when the military police ousted President Aristide. Tens of thousands of Haitians came to America for refuge, but hundreds of HIV positive Haitians found themselves in a political limbo due to the US exclusion policy. Immigration officials ruled that Haitians had valid claims for political asylum and should not be repatriated back to their country due to fear of persecution. However, the exclusion policy prevented them for, for entrance into the US and they were detained for more than 18 months in deplorable conditions at our US naval base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Another group to feel the wrath of HIV was gay men. In the early 80s, they began to find themselves once again despised and rejected. Gideon Dugas, a good-looking blonde flight attendant from Canada, is now the new face of HIV. He was most commonly known as Patient Zero. His face was plastered all over news and print. Ironically, the reason he was known as Patient Zero is someone reading his medical record wrong and then putting that information out there. He was actually patient, zero, patient O for outside California. 
Mr. Dugas died with most of the world blaming and loathing him and everything he stood for, myself included. We believed all we heard on the news, and since no one knew anything about this disease, we had to blame somebody. It was argued that the virus had only appeared to be afflicting individual, individuals with questionable moral character. Due to that stigma, it was low on the U.S. health officials' priority list, therefore receiving minimal funding for research and treatment. It wasn't until the mid to late 1980s officials learned that it could be passed through blood transfusions, that the disease started to get the attention it deserved with the help of a 13-year-old boy, Ryan White, from Kokomo, Indiana, who had gotten HIV due to one of his many blood transfusions due to his hemophilia. Ryan was told he could no longer attend school or be with his friends, and this made him angry. He decided he was going to fight back the best way he can and educate America on how one contracts and passes on the disease. Now, Ryan, became the new face of HIV. Ryan taught us that HIV could not be transmitted through casual touch, and he started to change the stigma HIV had been assigned. Americans listened to what he said, and views of the virus started to change, albeit slowly, the change was happening. The difference between this disease and the other diseases I had mentioned is that the persecuted were able to fight back, and many joined in. In 2009, President Obama finally ended the 22-year ban on the HIV-positive non-citizens, stating, if we want to be a global leader in combating HIV and AIDS, we need to act like it. Now, we talk about reducing the stigma of the disease, yet we've treated our visitors living with it as a threat. The virus did not come from a particular group of people. It came from eating tainted chimpanzee meats. Chimpanzees have what's known as simian immunodeficiency virus, say a distant cousin to HIV, that mutated in humans. The first blood came, sample came from the Democratic Republic of Congo in 1959. Chances are it came up through Africa to Haiti and on to America. So why the deep need to rationalize where and how diseases came about? Why do and did we need to put a face to that disease and make sure that, that our face, that, that face is not our face? The overall feeling is nobody wants to be the face of the disease. So we're going to go ahead and blame those that we dislike and distrust the most. In the past, people had no way of understanding where and how diseases can be passed on. Their ignorance would almost be understandable, if not so horrific in nature. But now we know better. So what is our excuse for still treating groups of people so poorly? Again, I must say ignorance, or what is commonly being called now xenophobia. We need to educate ourselves before one passes judgment on other groups of individuals, as scapegoating is still prevalently prevalent and con continuing to hurt others. Thank you, Michelle, for such a wonderful speech on the topic of scapegoating. I must you worked very hard over the course of this semester. Our next speaker is of Asian, of Asian descent. He's currently a sophomore at Broward College who is pursuing an associate art degree in biomedical engineering because of his passion for science. Now, please give us a round of applause for William Miller, who's going to talk about where virus are the dictators, U.S. policy, and the 20th century AIDS crisis. A few months ago, I became interested in our viruses, such as the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV for short. 
played a role in the history of the United States of America. As I read the introduction of Silent Travelers, a book written by Alan Crock, the fact that Americans associated HIV with Haitians struck my curiosity, mostly because I'm also a native of Haiti. The world first became aware of the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, also known as AIDS, in the summer of 1981. Later in 1984, a French biologist named Montagnier will be the first one to isolate and identify HIV, the retrovirus which causes AIDS. A retrovirus is a virus that invades the host cells, and once inside, it infiltrates the host genome, thus causing the host to replicate more retrovirus, which will exit the host cells and eventually repeat the cycle of another cell. HIV is one of the few retroviruses that attacks humans. To make matters worse, it only invades white blood cells, the last line of human and the human body when there is an infection. HIV and AIDS continue to inflict many casualties in the world and to bring chaos in third world countries and overpopulated regions such as India. However, AIDS not only wrecks havoc in the world by taking the life of many of its victims, but also dictates the policies that the affected countries adopt to the threat that it represents, causes prejudices upon the already infected based on their cultural identity, and siphons plenty of resources through the prevention and treatment of AIDS. AIDS not only influences the health of humans, but also plays a huge role in politics, which is directly related to policies and public health. Due to the way that HIV transfers into the type of people that mostly affects, governments have been ashamed when their countries suffer from AIDS epidemics. The policies that emerge due to these circumstances have been double-edged swords. At first, these policies, these policies were supposed to prevent the situation from worsening, such as the one to educate the masses. However, the human factor only worsened the situation. A fitting example would be the 1987 discriminatory policy that bans HIV-positive immigrants from entering the United States. The government believed that stopping immigrants with HIV would slow down the epidemic. Well, to put it simply, it could not be more wrong, since HIV does not transmit through physical contacts, but through blood contact or tainted blood transfusion, which puts hemophiliacs and people practicing unprotected sexual intercourse at a greater risk. In the early 1990s, the United States unconsciously detained several Asian immigrants at Camp Balkany, a United States naval station in Guantanamo Bay. Cuba, because they were tested HIV positive and wanted to take refuge in the United States. Some governments have even sometimes turned a blind eye to policies that could help the war against AIDS, due to a reluctance to engage on sensitive issues, such as those inseparably linked to HIV transmission, at least so they thought, the homosexual men and Aryan addicts. During the 20th century, the American government believed that an AIDS epidemic was synonymous to a gay or erring epidemic, which brought this sense of shame upon the government. The United States initially ignored the issue. The issue. As a result, most other governments behaved the same way because they were following the footsteps of the United States government, since the United States government was the world leader in scientific innovation at that time. As soon as AIDS and HIV were discovered, the government's first reaction should have been to educate its citizens about the disease instead of allowing it to go unnoticed and unchecked, especially since the disease has no early symptoms. Sadly, this was not the case. As with many diseases that transcend physical conditions, AIDS renders relationships difficult because of the many false assumptions and judgments about the people that are infected. The main cause of these prejudices is the shameful ways that HIV is transmitted. When it comes to diseases that also affect people on a social level, we have two types of people. The infected, those who are ill, and the affected, those who are somehow related to those who are ill, whether it is a sort of relationship or even simply sharing their cultural background. Due to those prejudgments, both the infected and the affected experience behavioral changes, such as loss of self-esteem and a decrease in beliefs about what they can achieve which in turn makes them withdrawn, aggressive, and rude to their peers. As if rendering relationships difficult did not suffice, many infected and affected people socially isolate themselves due to the stigma within society against them. Once someone learns that they have been infected with HIV, they sometimes find themselves in shock and disbelief to the point where they must reevaluate their identity. They fear the changes that will take place in their lifestyle. 
After Americans caught on to the news of the bill on HIV positive America, they began to assume that immigrants were the cause of HIV. Many people were affected by these presumptions, even if they were healthy, just because they shared the same cultural background as the most discriminated against immigrants. Many Asians had lost jobs, housing, or educational privileges on these bases. AIDS has affected the economy of many governments in two major ways, forcing them to cope with the direct cost of preventing and treating AIDS and imposing restraints on jobs due to the rate of disease and dead adults from AIDS. On the macroeconomy, the impact imposed by AIDS has been difficult to estimate due to many factors involved. However, the influence is clearer on the economy of countries that are heavily infected by the epidemic. Since, 19, since 1985, the epidemic has taken the lives of 7 million agricultural workers in the 25 worst affected countries of Sub-Saharan Africa. And in other words, AIDS has decreased the labor force of agriculture-dependent nations to a greater degree. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as CDC, estimated the lifetime hospital cost of the first 10,000 patients with AIDS reported in the United States at about $1.5 billion, or $147 per AIDS patient, per an article written by A.A. Shinstoski. AIDS has not been the only microbiological dictator that the U.S. has known. Others include the bubonic plague, tuberculosis, trachoma, typhus fever, cholera, and most recently Ebola. However, these viruses have not only wrecked havoc in the world by taking the life of many of their victims, but also dictated countries' political behaviors, caused prejudices upon their victim and their cultural identity, and siphoned a lot of resources through the fight between humanity and these microscopic dictators. Although small, these viruses have a tremendous impact on the world. Their effect transcends physical ailments and discomfort, and influences society to create policies that are xenophobic and segregate specific races, such as in the case where Asians were held unconstitutionally at Guantanamo Bay. As a fellow Asian, I was ignorant to the past of my people. But now I have learned that if I do not educate myself about, about the past of my ethnic group, the mistake that they have done, and or the injustice that has been done to them, my repeal itself, and I will not be able to stop it. And by turning the tail, I'm taking the first step toward rectifying the wrong that they had injured. This international relations major is a member of the Political Science Club here on South Campus, Model United Nations, and the Honor Student Council. Presenting, throwing shade, shining a light on the United States Public Health Service, everyone please give a warm welcome to Brandon Sirijo. Thank you, Tyler. So, just a bit about me. As an international relations major, I have grown to love the study of public policy, which is probably why when policy topics such as Obamacare and the newly proposed American Healthcare Act, aka Obamacare Light, started circulating the news, I was quick to grab my laptop and read up as much as I can with a big, fat grin on my face. But besides public policy, I'm fascinated by the philosophy of public politics. And yet, after all this, I still wonder why I'm single. <laughs> why are you laughing? Okay. But I digress. Back to philosophy. Now, I'm particularly intrigued by political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who in the 1600s focused many of his writings on the problem of social and political order, a doctrine which begged the question, how can humans live together in peace yet avoid the chaotic nature of mankind. These chaotic attributes Hobbes was referencing includes greed, malice, ignorance, a thirst for war. But simply put, Hobbes believed that people are mistakes, and people make mistakes, and that we as citizens need a governing body in order to avoid the universal state of insecurity. Specifically, the United States Public Health Service was created to stand on the microscopic front line, tasked with protecting the citizens of this country through initiatives such as anti-tobacco campaigns and internationally from Central America to Asia. However, this now benevolent organization has a darker past, a past which author Howard Markell highlights in When Germs Travel. Now what I want to specifically discuss today is first, 
why the USPHS was created, second, what about its past makes it so controversial, and third, what are they doing today, how are they serving our country, and does that make up for their past? So, I think it's fair to start with a brief history of the USPHS before completely scrutinizing their obscure and controversial background. Established in 1798 under President John Adams with the Act for the Relief of Sick and Disabled Seamen, a very creative name for a bill that would create the U.S. Marine Hospital Service and start the gradual implementation of marine hospitals along national waterways, specifically the East Coast and the Gulf Coast, and the implementation of public health policy here in the U.S. The administrative position of the Surgeon General was created to oversee and maintain this U.S. Marine Hospital Service. Many of us have read cigarette boxes before, right? If you haven't, spoiler alert, smoking kills. <laughs> Labeled on the side of these boxes is the Surgeon General's warning, a labeling to warn users of the dangers of smoking. The first Surgeon General, John Maynard Woodworth, established a military model of administration requiring military-style uniforms for physicians in the service, as well as a cadre or a group of career doctors assigned to mobile floating hospitals. Furthermore, the Quarantine Act of 1878 expanded the powers of the US MHS to declare regions of America quarantined if they deemed it unfit for living due to disease or zombies. And I think this is a good place to tell the dark tale of the US MHS, later the US Public Health Service. Now, our tale begins in 1900 San Francisco with a Chinese laborer named Chick Jin. Now, Chick Jin, who was found dead in his cot in one of the many slum hotels in San Francisco for newly arrived immigrants, had with what Markel described as foamy, blood-tinged spittle that covered his lips. His skin was ashen gray and cold to the touch, and under the threadbare blanket that covered his naked body, there were baseball-sized swellings underneath his groin and armpits. After performing an autopsy, Dr. Frank P. Wilson, San Francisco's medical examiner, immediately realized that the physical abnormalities on Chick Jin's body were synonymous with the Black Plague, or Yersinia pestis, and immediately notified senior health officer Dr. A.P. O'Brien and city bacteriologist Wilfred Kellogg, both of which confirmed Wilson's fear. A disease known for killing millions of people over hundreds of years and is passed on due to the minute fleas, specifically Xenocelia cheopsis, has reached the city limits of San Francisco, which in 1900 was the ninth largest city in the U.S. and a sprawling hub for immigrants, especially those from China, looking to make a new life for themselves here in the country. In order to prevent the disease from spreading even further, the Health Department of San Francisco called on the U.S. Marine Hospital Service and Assistant Surgeon General Joseph Kinyun. Now, Kinyun, described by Markel as industrious and hardworking, is also credited with founding the first bacterial laboratory in the United States at the Marine Hospital in Staten Island. This would ultimately be the precursor to today's National Institutes of Health. It also goes without saying, that Kinyon was described as a xenophobe and arrogant amongst his colleagues and was unable to provide the San Franciscan Health Department with the definitive answers they needed. After less than 25 hours of the initial local diagnosis of Chick Jin, patient zero, on March 7, 1900, the Department of Health of San Francisco declared a quarantine on the Chinese district. Residents would awake in the morning to quarantine ropes, armored police around their town, and doctors in surgical masks searching house to house, retracing Chick Jin steps, and apprehending anyone suspected of being infected. But by March 9th, surprisingly, the quarantine was lifted. Dr. April O'Brien justified this action by stating, we raised the blockade because the general clamor had become too great to ignore, and we desired to injure no more people than was absolutely necessary. Although it seemed like the hell on the Chinese quarter was over, three months after the initial quarantine lift in Washington, D.C., Surgeon General Walter Wyman, who was monitoring the situation, essentially said, psych, and reinstated the blockade on Chinatown. Except this time with good old Uncle Sam, big brother, federal government involved with Joseph Kinyon. Remember him, the racist, arrogant doctor? Yeah, him. High five history. 
This second rollout also featured the heavy hand of its enforcers, comprised of doctors and police who burned private property in an effort to eradicate the disease and brutally beat those who did not cooperate. One very interesting facet of this implementation of this quarantine was the gerrymandering or blocking out of white businesses and excluding them from the scrutinization Chinese business owners faced. It soon became clear that this issue stemmed deeper than the disease itself. For native-born Americans, Chinatown was considered a pungent foreign place and avoided the area at all costs in order to elude the yellow menace, as the residents were called. A public health policy set to protect the citizens only divided the population and corralled them as if they were less than human. A year after this ordeal, Secretary Lyman J. Gage of the Treasury Department and Executive Administrator of the Marine Hospital Service commissioned three of the foremost experts on the Black Plague to investigate the outbreak in San Francisco. According to Markel, the experts advised the Secretary that the best precautions to preventing another outbreak was to isolate people based on infection, not on race, and to focus eradication efforts such as fumigation on areas known for infection. It is clear that for a greater part of its history, the USPHS dictated many of its public policy on xenophobia and pseudoscience instead of empirical evidence and fact. They used their authority to per persecute hundreds simply based on how they looked, how they spoke, and how un-American they seemed. Now the question is, after decades of malpractice, how have the USPHS, America's hospital, redeemed themselves? And what are they doing today? Well, aside from the anti-tobacco campaigns and the compilation of 50 years worth of data to create the most up-to-date research on tobacco usage, in 2005, after Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wil Wilma, 2,400 members of the service were deployed in what would be the largest domestic public health relief effort in U.S. history. In their capacity, the USPHS established field hospitals and coordinated with local and state entities to, to help the victims of these natural disasters. Moreover, in 2008, collaborating with the Department of Defense, officers of the USPHS created the Partnership for Psychological Health. This program ensured that service members and their families received proper mental health care access. And in 2015, due to their work in West Africa, leading the fight against the Ebola virus, President Obama bestowed the Presidential Unit Citation for gallantry and a spirited core under stressful and hazardous conditions. Through their work, the overall number of cases of Ebola in the region have dropped dramatically, allowing the affected nations to recover. But after all the good they've done in the recent decade, does that make up for the lack of judgment in the past? I think it's important to understand that in order to determine the future we want, not just in terms of public health policy, but in national legislative agendas, we need to understand our past. And as the old saying goes, those who fail to understand history are doomed to repeat it. This cyclical cycle of ignorance is eventually going to be the final nail in our coffin. Only by understanding our mistakes, much like the USPHS, we can form a more perfect, healthy union. Thank you, Brandon, for that incredibly informative presentation about the United States Public Health Service. Personally, I never would have guessed that something like public health care would have started out as a military organization. While I'm up here, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers for their amazing speeches. Katya's presentation about an invention that makes our lives less crappy. <laughs> Michelle's impassioned account of the blame game. We get personal touch on his lecture about HIV and Haitian discrimination. And of course, Brandon's journalistic approach to the darker history of the United States Public Health Service. We'll all leave here today having learned something from each of you. Thank you. Please give our brilliant speakers a round of applause. Can I 
please have the speakers move to the front so that we can begin the question and answer session. And while you prepare your questions and they move front forward, you were all handed a survey when you walked in, so I'll be helping you understand how it works exactly. We have the ten questions. <clears throat> On a scale from one to five, answer each of them, with one being strongly disagreeing and five being that you strongly agree. Please do fill this survey out as it does affect my grade. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any questions? Just raise your hand. Gentleman right here in the front. Okay. As a matter of fact, last year, he finally was cleared from any patient zero, and his death is probably a little bit more dignified now. All right, Sophia? Thank you for your question. Um, I, I really do believe that microbes and viruses affect our public policy because it's something that our government has to react to. Their job is to protect us as the people and they have to react accordingly. So for instance, recently with uh, H1N1 uh, or even the Zika virus, uh, we were blocking out parts of Linwood because of the Zika virus. We were taking precautions, um, the government issued precautions for uh, pregnant women so that they don't get uh, microcephaly, which is a, 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 a direct condition caused by Zika virus. So yes, I do believe that microbes and viruses are affected our public health policy. All right. This gentleman here. Um, his question was, why do we call toilets and croppers? Um, during the World War I, um, most of the toilets that the soldiers used were produced by the Thomas Proper Company. And the soldiers just like adapt like the slang to it and they just bring it back to the United States. So that's the reason why. The young lady right here in the white sweater. Thank you. Her question was, are uh, private agencies like Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross um, better suited to attack uh, viruses instead of the government? <clears throat> I do believe that in some aspects, yes, if we're discussing internationally and for nations who don't have the resources like we do in our country to properly combat disease, I do think that the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders um, are, are essential to combating disease. For instance, Doctors Without Borders did amazing work in West Africa, working alongside the United States Public Health Service to combat Ebola. And this is a private organization with doctors that are volunteers. So I do believe that with private organizations, disease has a better chance of becoming eradicated, that they play a key role in, in keeping us healthy and keeping us safe. Could we perhaps have a question from this side of the room? <laughs> Is that a hand up, or are you just pointing at someone? Oh, I think he's really good. <laughs> All right, that is not quite a question, but I'll take it. All right, this gentleman again. What we get? Okay. And his question was, what is the difference between HIV and AIDS? HIV is the retrovirus that causes the, the sickness known as AIDS. So AIDS will be the sickness, and HIV will be the cause. Question was, uh, <laughs> uh, HIV changes the DNA of the white blood cells, then how are white blood cells supposed to fight off the infection? Uh, his question was, HIV... 
changes the DNA of the white blood cells, so how the white blood cells are supposed to fight off the infection of HIV. And that is why uh, AIDS is known as a threat politically and pretty much everywhere because it will, it will be very difficult for our body to fight it up since it, once it gets inside our cells, it pretty much recall the, the entire genome of our cells in a way so that it makes more HIV virus inside our body. So it's pretty much not only using our own, like the food that we eat to like produce and everything, but also change our code. So that's why it's like it's so hard to fight it up. But it might be possible like for like someone really lucky that before the HIV gets inside the white blood cells, that the white blood cells then uh, is going to kill it. But that's why we need so much research. We need to do so much more research about the virus itself. The gentleman here in the glasses. Uh, he is asking what is the wash rate of the toilets that people use in Japan. Um, they have like it's like a toilet, but it's like um, like a modern toilet. I mean, you can um, choose a. Um, from a lot of features, you can choose like heated seat. Um, you can choose the they have a bidet, so you can choose also the temperature of the water. And sometimes they have deodorants too, so it's like a really nice toilet. All right, who else wants one of those? <laughs> that sounds amazing, right? <laughs> All right, do we have any more? Ah. In the back. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, expand or just go a little bit further when we were talking about the efforts in West Africa with the United States uh, Health Service and Doctors Without Borders. The sad commentary there is that Doctors Without Borders um, sounded an alarm one year before the outbreak of Ebola happened. And the World Health Organization felt that this was not an issue. So it was a failure, even though that the impending epidemic was going to hit, that it was viewed, unfortunately, as something not to be concerned with. And, and when the endemic infection started, then that's the only time, and it was a pro, it was a reactive rather than a proactive move to address that infection. And once it did, once you started seeing it spread, very similar to the way HIV presented in the United States in the 1980s, when you saw it spread outside the populations that you thought it wouldn't, only then did the international community come into play to deal with that as opposed to being proactive, they were reactive. And you would have thought by this time, knowing what we've learned about HIV, that reactive, at least when it comes to infectious diseases, is not the way to prevent those diseases or to treat them. so much for adding that. I actually didn't know that. That's really interesting. I think that what happens a lot in government is that we, the government tends to not react how we want them to react. So we would want them to be proactive, as you said. We want them to do what they have to do, but at the end of the day, stuff like this tends to get pushed to the bottom of their list until one of their own people has been infected, until there are millions of people who are dying, which is it's terrible and it's sad, and I, I, I do appreciate that you added that commentary to <laughs> All right, I believe we have time for exactly one more question. Yes, this wonderful lady right here. It's for Michelle or for Katya? Okay.
I mean, we are not, honestly, we're, here in the United States, we are not doing enough with that issue. Um, there are other countries that they have like um, these um, things that are filled with crap and they produce energy and it is a uh, energy that it can be used as, as long as we exist. I mean, it's a very um, creative way and at least here in the United States, we are, we should be like take an approach to take another techniques or that other countries are using in other in his countries like we we should take that approach that question. Unfortunately, we are out of time with, for questions, but I would like to introduce the two lovely ladies that made all of this possible, Jamie Lux and Laura Kisana. for coming out. Uh, Jamie and I would like to begin by thanking Dr. Cornejo, of course, for this amazing <laughs> We'd like to thank Myron Ross for helping us out with everything. Um, we would also like to thank Sandy Gans for helping with the creation of our poster. And finally, of course, we would love to thank our classmates. You guys worked so hard and you were so dedicated to all of this, so give them a big round of applause. We also want to thank Richard and Marcos for helping out with sound and technology. Thank you, So next up, I'd like to bring up Dr. Roberts, beloved English teacher and exceptional honors college coordinator. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Roberts and I am the honors coordinator here at the South Campus. Uh, part of the goal of the Honors College is to create an active scholarly community for our students. And the program that you've seen today is clearly the fruit of that labor. Um, can I just have everybody give the presenters today, and everyone who worked on the program, just another round of applause. really what honors is about. Everyone who participated today has shown that learning really needs to happen um, outside of the classroom and extend beyond those classroom doors. Um, it is not an easy thing to get out of your comfort zone and to come into a venue like this, on a stage like this, and perform for your peers. That's not an easy thing to do. And they took a risk in doing that, and frankly, I think their risk really paid off. Wonderful, wonderful job. Not only did the students um, research countless hours to put this together, but they have actually planned every facet of the event today. That from the programming, to the marketing, to the logistics, everything. And I learned a lot. I realized how much I actually do not know about this issue. And as I was sitting there watching them, it occurred to me that the students were actually, before my very eyes, becoming the teachers. And that's pretty cool. And, but, I would only say that behind every great teacher is a great teacher. And I would be remiss not to acknowledge the extraordinary work of Dr. Cornejo, who spent the entire semester guiding and mentoring these students so that they could have this moment today. So thank you again, Dr. Cornejo. Thank you for your 
commitment to the student's scholarship. If you heard something today or saw something today that sparked your interest, I encourage you to speak with me, your coordinator, to Dr. Cornejo, or any of the students who participated today, and ask how you can get involved in the honors program. There's a lot of opportunity out there, and we would really love to have you. And with that, I thank you for coming, I thank you for supporting your peers, and of course, thank you for supporting honors.